You're listening to Book Insights, brought to you by Memoed, finding and simplifying the world's most powerful ideas to fit into your lifestyle. Each episode is a deep dive into a nonfiction bestseller that can change your life or make you think. In around 30 minutes, you'll learn all about a book that offers wisdom for your life, career, or business. So get ready to live and work smarter, better, and happier with Book Insights. In the year 2000, neurological researcher Eleanor McGuire did a study of 2,000 London black cab drivers. To get their license, drivers have to pass a stringent test called the knowledge. McGuire found that the part of the brain's hippocampus related to spatial awareness, needed obviously to get passengers to their destination, was physically 7% bigger than the average adults. Yet when McGuire did a similar study of mental athletes, such as people who performed amazing feats of recall in memory competitions, she found that their brains were structurally no different than the norm. Neither did they have a higher IQ than average. Why had the brains of the mental athletes not changed like the cab drivers? The reason? Compared to the cab drivers, these memory masters were doing less mental heavy lifting. They were simply using age-old techniques that involved taking raw information and turning it into images. These images were then placed along a mental roadway or within a mind map, such as a palace with many rooms. McGuire's research would suggest that anyone can develop a brilliant memory. But can we? This question fired the imagination of freelance journalist Joshua Four, and he decided to write a book about it. It's called Moonwalking with Einstein, The Art and Science of Remembering Everything. It centers around a challenge— Can four get good enough at memorizing to compete at America's Memory National Championships? The memory champions tell four that it's more a matter of practice and application than genius. He collects people on his journey to help him. One is Ed Cook, a young Oxford-educated Englishman who competes in memory competitions. Another is Anders Ericsson, the famed psychology professor considered the world expert on expertise, or how people get better at things. He meets memory guru, Tony Buzan, who is pushing for a return to the ancient memory techniques. In this book insight, we'll focus on four key points from Four's book. First, the connection between having a great memory and being an expert in something. Second, the mechanics of memory or why humans find it easier to remember some things rather than others. Third, why in an online world, having a great memory is still a key to being creative and successful. And fourth, What happens when Four goes to the memory championships, whether he triumphs or flops? Four's experience leaves him with a discovery, the forgotten link between memory and the development of character. We'll conclude by asking a question, what is the future and worth of memorization in an age in which everything can be stored? Let's start with how memory maketh the expert. Four wants to know if there's any scientific basis for developing a great memory quickly. He delves into the academic journals to find out and discovers Anders Ericsson. Ericsson is running the Human Performance Lab at Florida State University. He is the world expert on experts and has demonstrated what makes a difference to others in any field. Experts see things the less experienced don't see, honing in on one or two telling details. This, combined with an ability to take in the overall situation, allows them to come to a judgment that is usually right. What has this got to do with memory? Well, experts are experts because they link what they are seeing now with lots of information they have stored in their long-term memory. Experienced SWAT officers will notice a nervous twitch in a man's arm that recalls lots of times in the past when he's seen a similar mannerism. No one else will notice the twitch, but for the SWAT officer, it's a red flag that he associates with crimes about to be committed. Chicken sexers describe their judgments about whether a chick is male or female as intuition. This is true to the extent that their judgments are not really conscious. They just know a chicken is male or female because their brains are seeing visual patterns. As with the SWAT officers, it's a feat of perception and memory, not analysis. It's been shown that chess grandmasters don't have higher IQs than regular chess players. Neither does their advantage lie in seeing more moves ahead than the other players. Rather, they're winners because they simply see the right moves and they see them very quickly. They're marked by their unusual ability to memorize whole boards of previous games and they draw on this memory to make the best moves in the game in front of them. 
Here's four in a TED talk explaining how this works. At the most basic level, we remember when we pay attention. We remember when we are deeply engaged. We remember when we are able to take a piece of information and experience and figure out why it is meaningful to us, why it is significant, why it's colorful. The more meaningful the context, the more easily we can recall things. This is why there's really no such thing as a chess prodigy. The ability to make the best moves depends on having a library of move memories from thousands of games. Even Bobby Fischer played intensely for nine years before he became a chess grandmaster at 15. The top chess players not only make much better moves, but they do it quicker since they are not analyzing the board, but just doing what seems obvious to them based on their long memories of previous games. The difference between a top player and a lower ranked one is that the champs see the game in front of them within the context of thousands of previous games and millions of moves. The lesser player looks at the chessboard and sees something new. When Four asks Erickson what expertise is, he replies that it's just vast amounts of knowledge, pattern-based retrieval, and planning mechanisms acquired over many years of experience in the associated domain. In plain English, an excellent memory isn't just an important part of being an expert in something, or a result of being an expert. Deep memory is the heart of expertise. Let's take a break for now. We've gone over the first key point from Joshua Four's Moonwalking with Einstein. We learned how great memories aren't a gift; they're a skill to master. You draw better memories when you're engaging, and you remember better when you have lots of experiences to draw from. Next time, we'll cover the next two key points from Moonwalking with Einstein. First, we'll cover why some memories are easier to recall than others. Then, we'll look at how memory is valued in a digital age. Enjoying this episode of Book Insights? If so, keep listening and learning. There's a collection of over a hundred titles you can read or listen to now at memoadapp.com/insights. That's m-e-m-o-d-a-p-p.com/insights. We're continuing our analysis on Joshua Four's book. It's Moonwalking with Einstein: The Art and Science of Remembering Everything. Previously, we've covered the first key point: how memory maketh the expert. We'll look at the next two points now. First, we'll cover the mechanics of memory. Then we'll look at the importance of having a great memory in an online world. Our brains developed during the Pleistocene age. They evolved in order to make us survive, which meant knowing where to find food and being aware of what plants are edible and which are poisonous. This meant having a large visual memory, so we became good at remembering images. Why are we not so good at remembering numbers? Simply because we didn't really need them to survive. This is why a ten or eleven digit phone number needs to be broken into chunks for us to have any chance of recalling it. A survey of British people under thirty found that a third can't even recall their home landline number or the birthdays of more than three family members. What memory techniques do is take the style of remembering that we humans are naturally excellent at, and use it to make us remember things like strings of numbers that we never evolved to be good at. Scholars of Homer's Odyssey and Iliad noticed that the classics had lots of descriptive phrases repeated over and over, such as "clever Odysseus," "laughing Aphrodite," "rosy-fingered Dawn." Why the clunkiness in what were otherwise masterpieces? An answer emerged. The works had long been transmitted orally before they were ever written down, and only later attributed to a single author, Homer. The colorful, recurring phrases were specifically designed to help people memorize the stories, make the details easy, and you remember the narrative. Here is Four in his TED talk going into how he and the other memory athletes trained. We've all trained ourselves to perform these miraculous feats of memory. Using a set of ancient techniques, techniques invented 2,500 years ago in Greece, the same techniques that medieval scholars had used to memorize entire books. The brain best remembers things that are repeated, rhythmic, rhyming, structured, and above all, easily visualized. The early bards knew this when they created or repackaged stories. It's why the Homeric works were sung. Why the Jewish Torah has musical annotations, and why we teach children the alphabet in the form of a tune. Songs are the best way we have found for learning the structure of language. 
They are perfect for brains that recall images and tunes more easily than numbers or words on their own. Joshua 4 sits in his underpants in his parents' basement. He's got earmuffs and blinders on. He's trying to cut out all visual and aural distraction. You see, 4 is trying to memorize long lists of numbers by creating ever more bizarre images associated with them. One image is Albert Einstein walking on the moon. 4 wonders, what the hell am I doing? Does memorizing actually have any use, or is it just mental peacocking? He meets a Bronx school teacher, Raymond Matthews, who believes that teaching his deprived students memory techniques will give them an edge in the real world. Matthews tells him, The memorization of quotes enables a person to seem more legitimate. Who are you going to be more impressed by, the person who has a litany of his own opinions, or the historian who can draw on the great thinkers who came before him? Yet as Ford notes, memorization has long been out of fashion in education. Here is Ford discussing this contemporary issue in his TED Talk. These technologies have made our modern world possible, but they've also changed us. They've changed us culturally, and I would argue that they've changed us cognitively. Having little need to remember anymore, it sometimes seems like we've forgotten how. It was once thought that memorizing particular things like American presidents, Latin verbs, and capital cities gave a person a better memory overall, and this was encouraged. But when psychologists showed that this wasn't true, the argument for repetitive learning was eroded. In its place, educators pushed for a more child-centered education with a smaller role for rote memorization. Instead of memorizing plant names from a textbook, children should plant their own gardens. Learning today is based on this view. The purpose is to improve reasoning, creativity, and independent thinking. But did we go too far in this direction? Educator and literary critic Ed Hirsch Jr. argued there's a baseline of cultural literacy that every child should have. Two-thirds of American 17-year-olds don't know within 50 years when the Civil War happened. But does learning such things mean a reversion to a dead white males 101 kind of education? Bronx teacher Raymond Matthews says no. As he puts it, a good education means the ability to analyze information. You can't do this without being able to retrieve some of it at will. Memory may be crucial for creativity, too. Memory expert Tony Bazan believes creativity is the pulling together of disparate ideas and making associations. The more facts, ideas, and images you have at your mental disposal, the more creative you can be. Bazan reminds us that the ancient goddess of memory, Mnemosyne, was not just any other old god, but the mother of the muses. It's no accident that the Latin word inventio gave rise to two modern words, invent and inventory. To create something new, you need access to what has come before and have the ability to access it. The minds of educated people in classical and medieval times were like immaculate and well-ordered filing cabinets. Quotes, hymns, stories, poems, and facts were stored to be used at will. From this storehouse, new things could be and were made. It takes knowledge to gain knowledge, Four wrote. Maybe it's superficial for a school student to memorize the causes of the First World War, but at least the student has something to build on, a starting place. Without a base of knowledge, you're likely to forget a fact because you just don't know how to locate it or store it. The people Ford admires most can retrieve an appropriate quote or story from history at will. This ability is the essence of being educated. There's another reason why memorization should be restored. The more you know, the more easily you can accommodate new information and fit it into your existing mental palace. You'll be better able to create something genuinely new because you'll know what's come before. Other people may think they're doing something original. You'll actually know if you are. Let's break for now. This time we've gone over two of the key points from Moonwalking with Einstein by Joshua Four. We've gone over the why and how some people seem to remember things better than others. Then, we've covered how memory fell out of favor in learning and why it should be better regarded, especially within the realm of creativity. Next time, we'll conclude our discussion on Moonwalking with Einstein. We'll wrap up Four's quixotic journey to become a world-recognized memory champion. Enjoying this episode of Book Insights? If so, keep listening and learning. There's a collection of over 100 titles you can read or listen to now at memodeapp.com slash insights. 
That's M-E-M-O-D-A-P-P dot com slash insights. We're concluding our discussion on Moonwalking with Einstein, the art and science of remembering everything. It's written by journalist Joshua Four. The previous three key points forms the backbone of the book, and it moves along at a quick pace thanks to the unfolding story of Four's competing at American memory competitions. A few weeks before his first competition, he's astonished to realize that he can memorize a deck of cards in the same time as the U.S. record. He started out practicing memory techniques just as a kind of deep journalistic immersion, but it has become an obsession. His parents wonder what the hell he's doing in the basement hour after hour, day after day. The skills that gradually accrue to him comes as the result of long, tedious hours devising ever more outlandish and lewd images for cards, words, and numbers that can stick in his brain. Four amazed himself by memorizing a pack of cards in one minute and 40 seconds. He feels ready to attend the U.S. memory competitions and book his flight. We'll cover the results of the competition. The best memorizers treat their feel like a science, constantly testing themselves, trying out new techniques and theories, and focusing on particular areas of memory. Anders Ericsson calls this system deliberate practice. It involves clear goals and feedback, and constantly working on what you find difficult. This is the key to improvement, not going about it in a haphazard way where nothing is measured. Just to spoil the suspense, here is Four explaining what happened with the competition in his TED Talk. I ended up coming back to that same contest that I had covered a year earlier, and I had this notion that I might enter it and make, I thought, maybe a nice epilogue to all my research. Problem was, the experiment went haywire. I won the contest. Four became the new U.S. record holder in speed cards and goes on to win the U.S. Memory Championship. In his triumph, he books a place at the World Championship. Even though Europeans beat out the Americans at competitive memorization at the World event, Four still comes 13th out of 37 competitors. Not bad for someone who only seriously began in the field a year or so before. By now, Four knew the truth of the phrase, practice makes perfect, but at some point in the journey, it clicked exactly what kind of practice was needed. You need super concentrated, deliberate, and self-aware practice. When combined with motivation and drive, a normal person could seem to do superhuman things. This knowledge deeply inspired Four. It made him ask, what else was I capable of doing if only I used the right approach? Finally, Four's experience chimed with what he had read about ancient memory techniques, that their purpose was not just to help a person recall facts, but to grow that person's character. The effort of memorization involves discipline and practice, and this in itself is empowering, regardless of the content of what is learned. He felt he had not just gained a skill, but developed who he was as a person. Given that we're now a culture in which memories are stored in the brains of our computers, what can be the point of improving our memory? Forget where you left your keys? Press replay. Forgot the person's name you met last night at the party? Rewind and check. This is probably just the beginning. Futurists see a time not far off when it may be possible to weld the sum of human knowledge to our brains and nervous systems. Such massive extension to our internal memories could dramatically change the power of humans. Already what we consider our self is found in our thousands of emails, documents, and photos. Life logging and neural expansion would just be an extension and progression of this. Four reminds us that in times past, memorization of things was not just considered useful, but a vital form of character development. It was only in memorizing ideas and stories that they could become truly part of one's psyche. To an onlooker, Remembering long lists or numbers or images on playing cards seems like a useless waste of time. But the same techniques can be used to etch onto the brain concepts and ethics that a society holds dear. Our particular bank of memories makes us who we are. As the subtitle of the book suggests, memorization is both science and art. It gives us power and allows for great learning. That's what makes us human. Before we conclude our exploration into moonwalking with Einstein, let's recap what we learned. We discovered the connection between having a great memory and being an expert in something. Then we covered the mechanics of memory, or why humans find it easier to remember some things rather than others. Next, 
we went over how having a great memory is still a key to being creative and successful in the digital age. Finally, we covered Four's journey to become a memory champion. Let's end with what went through Four's head when he won the contest in an interview at the Chicago Humanities Festival. The emotion that was running through my, my head or at that moment in time was, oh crap, my book is ruined. I was going to be telling this story about this universe of nerds, and now I was the king of the nerds. <laughs> <laughs>Thank you for listening to Book Insights. Check out the rest of our content at memodap.com. Please keep in mind that the information provided in or through our Book Insights episodes is for educational and informational purposes only. It's not intended to be a substitute for advice given by qualified professionals and should not be relied upon to disregard or delay seeking professional advice.